All right, here we go. This game is definitely high up there for me. I'm very excited for Hogwarts Legacy. You know, I have- I've, I've been very critical of this game. Like, a little bit too critical, I think, at times. But that's because it just, like, there's so many things that look so good about it, you know? Hey everybody, welcome to the Hogwarts Legacy Gameplay Showcase. I'm Chandler Wood, Community Manager here at Avalanche Software, and I'm honored to introduce you to our panel today. He's great too. First like, up, we have Chandler Wood's awesome. guest host, Ben Snow. Oh my god, I can't believe this is happening. Thank you so much for having me. And from the Avalanche team, we have Game Director, Alan He's nervous. <laughs> and Systems Designer, Mackenzie Toner. Hi. It's cool and that they bring on community guests. And screen capturing gameplay for us, Andrew Corum. <laughs> Today we'll be giving you a taste of the open world via broom flight, a deeper look at combat using the Dark Arts Battle Arena, and a look at your personalizable home within Hogwarts, the Room of Requirement, where we may even see some beasts. And we're starting right where we left off in our last gameplay showcase, just outside That's Hogwarts, cool! That's a good I, way to I do it! We can, you can walk out of the castle after w walking through everything, and then just You can out walk out of the castle broom, after walking through the, the castle. World. And Alan, I know that's something that you particularly like about yeah. Hogwarts Legacy too. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I'm a big fan of just being able to hop on the broom and, and go anywhere. There's something about kind of like the the sensation of of everything being open to you, and just I love the proximity that I can get to things. I love flying close to the ground, and and I I, I kind of wanted to talk about it just because I feel like um, you know the brooms are fun for me, not just because of all those feelings of exhilaration. But, but because they're not just, I have a broom and it's done. Uh, I actually kind of like some of the mechanics in it. So you can, you see in the lower right, there's a meter there. And, and occasionally as Andrew's kind of flying up or flying down, you might notice it, it draining or not. And, and this isn't the present day where all the broom technology is well known and advanced and, and, and everything that we know and love. This is an earlier time where they're still trying to figure out, you know, we're not at the 3,000 yet. We're at the, like, <laughs> we're at the 11. So. Oh my goodness. I just, I'm just so <laughs> speechless right now because this is just so beautiful. The world just looks so... By the way, the the broom, is that like the only one? Or can you like upgrade the broom? Yeah. Oh, so can you upgrade have, brooms? Uh, shop in Hogsmeade, actually a broom oh. shop. And so okay. that sells a variety of different brooms. And it was important to us that That's players cool. could customize themselves based on their own aesthetic. So they're purely cosmetic, but uh, if you talk to the shopkeep uh, and help them Ooh, out- Ooh, that some, sell, yeah, okay. Upgrades. So there's some random events yeah, going those, on those in the world. Will some procedural- so Where normally the broom, you can only fly- um, Some procedural you can events kind of like in the world. Meter down there. You can only go at max speed without the meter going down. Kind of closer to the ground and as you raise into the air you'll notice the meter drop and so those upgrades will allow you to increase that distance from the ground and there the the broom owner at at the sporting goods store in in hogsmeade is trying to perfect the broom and get better at it and and know it better and you can okay. participate that and get better and better brooms through that so you can you can you can upgrade them to kind of go a little bit faster for longer explore the world and kind of stay close to the ground it's not just a travel mechanic point a to point b you're not just flying high over everything, although it is beautiful, something I really love doing, but as well, there's lots to lots to explore on the ground, and so kind of keeping you down at the ground level. And to me, it feels like- Can they explain kind of those dueling feats that the, come up? Oh my God, like, I'm just like, I want to snatch the controller from Andrew right now because I want to go to the mountaintop, I want to go to the forest, and to that hamlet, or, well, well I, I don't know if that's how it's called. <laughs> I think that's what it is. No, it's awesome. But we're, there's a lot of locations in between, too. I, it's, I like it's nice that they're getting, is, like, you is, could see the mini-map on the bottom. Because that's what we refer to. So you can see how many locations there are to explore from lore that Hogsmeade is the only all wizarding village within Britain but we wanted other opportunities to kind of meet other characters out here and to kind of populate the landscape so it's not just kind of you know barren as you leave out this direction and that direction 
And so we just imagine these different Because these big these open worlds locations. can sometimes go very wrong when there's just nothing in, uh, and you're Scottish going Highlands. for five and minutes. So it's those, uh, Depends on the so world, of course. Like The Witcher, I don't mind it in. Opportunities to learn those wizard stories, um, how those different locations have kind of like learned to live, what their relationships are with characters at Hogsmeade and Hogwarts. And so they're both quest opportunities out here and a chance to kind of get to know more of the area, even beyond Hogwarts and Hogsmeade that we've already experienced. And you also notice on the mini map, like lots of little icons, and each one of those There's represents a lot of icons. gameplay in, in the Hamlets that you can participate in. You know, whether it's a vendor or different puzzles and challenges or different secrets that exist, um, each one of those icons are different opportunities for gameplay. And you'll notice the, that same thing as we venture out into the open world as well. So when you go out into the open world and you see, see those icons, whether they're on the mini map or on your map or off in the distance, those things are opportunities to say, like, I want to increase my inventory capacity. There are puzzles left behind by old wizards, you know, that you can solve that actually grant you those. Okay. Uh, if you see ruins off in, the, off in the distance and you visit them, you might find opportunities to actually expand and learn about your ancient magic. Inventory and upgrades you, by and doing... You kind of encounter different enemies dotted on the landscape. Sometimes those characters, uh, poachers, puzzles? dark wizards, might be hoarding different uh, magical resources that are valuable to you as you're playing the game. So each one has kind of like a way to connect to our gameplay loops and provide different opportunities that just kind of reward you for poking around. See, there's I mean, there's I little away, things, like little attention to detail things that I think can elevate this game to like well, we've, a little bit more. Like the already, fact that he just grabs the mug from so far, from is, five uh, feet away instead of like actually map. picking it up, drinking it, and then putting it down. Like where's that interactivity with certain things? Oh my God, there he just like pops out of the... <laughs> That's pretty cool. You can use it as a horsey. I mean, a horse. I mean, that is a, a horse. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a hippogriff, you can you can totally ride it like a ground. Okay. And you can lift off into the air, and we tried to make sure that. That's each, pretty cool. <laughs> each of those interactions, so the broom's really good at reaching that top speed, at at kind of traveling the world as quickly as possible. But sometimes it's really nice to get on the hippogriff because of that ground speed uh, or those transitions. Uh, and sometimes it just feels amazing just to be riding around on a hippogriff. That's a cool way to do it. The yeah, graphics are the it, graphics it really are really really like, good. Uh, I don't know. It's a great. I don't. I wouldn't say game Horizon game. Forbidden West. I think they're different. Different art styles. From run to fly and just being able to go wherever you want. And we tried to make sure that that those, that each one of these things that you can interact with have have a unique identity and a reason. And there's detection it. meters. <laughs> so there is <laughs> there is oh some God, stealth. Like I guess in like areas like a swampy area but the way can you go to like so that's cool. map anywhere you go there are regions that are like blocked from you yeah as soon like... as as soon as you there's kind of a moment where the world kind of opens up to you outside of hogwarts as a student and right from that moment uh, early on in the game you can go wherever you want and so you might nice. find more difficult challenges in different areas and you'll see different spots as andrew's moving around like you mentioned the swamp. there's so many um, markers in the bottom too kind of, like, so i'm coast, curious as to how engaging that content world, will be kind of uh, is it just like go here, fight for points, enemies, points, like fresh, move on? Uh, all those things exist. Is there actual storylines and like that quest threads that like will pop so up from some of them? Rustic, like I keep forgetting that this is like 1800s. The Wizarding World we've never really seen before. Like it feels so authentic. Like it just, it, it it's part of it. Yeah, I, I love this vista too, and and. I'm gonna have Andrew stop here. We're gonna use a bit of dev so magic good to uh, change the seasons. Actually, I want to see. I want you to see what this world looks like. Yeah, uh, covered in snow. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yes, yes, please. I love. That's that's a big thing. Like a big theme of the Harry Potter games. Like is the passage of time throughout the different seasons. Oh my God! This is so beautiful. Oh my goodness. That's cool. This is so that's really cool. Like, it was so realistic. Oh my god, it changes the landscape like completely. Oh my god, does it have like actual like gameplay impact? Like impact on the gameplay? Or does it like, it's just the weather of Scotland? Uh, yeah, we use it, we really use it as a narrative marker. I think he's to, a bit too to the over the top. So as ben ben Snow, he's a bit too excited. For us to kind of like have those for my taste. That kind of Felt like when it's like, all right, calm down a little bit. Where, you know, <laughs> like, you see kind of like the title card, winter, and, and now the But he's excited. He's a, don't don't really judge people for being excited about things. It's, that's 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 wrong. You know, going through your year at <laughs> right. Hogwarts, and I think I think we wanted to duplicate that. And for me, it's really fun that it's not just on the outside, which 
which I, I agree, I think it looked <laughs> really beautiful, um, but within the school as well. So there are moments like when it reaches certain holidays or things like that, where Hogsmeade oh, uh, reacts to God. holidays and the school reacts to holidays and you see the decorations around those environments change. Um, nice. That really helped just kind of make me feel like I'm there. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a really and, cool. And just, that's uh, a really cool thing that they actually you know, change the seasons, those those kind of the things, stuff um, as you go, so that you're constantly cycle, feeling fresh, even though you're going cycle, around the same landscape. It, even though similarly, like it's largely about vibe. When you go into Hogsmeade in the evening, there's less characters there. Uh, around the school, you'll notice it kind of dies down and quiets down. Just oh, when there's right, just yeah. candlelight and students, kind of like as you're walking through the halls. But in that day night cycle is where we've kind of placed uh, a few items where. You know whether or not you can collect them or whether or not you can interact with them with that are so like there's there's a little ha like all these places that we're passing by and there's no markers on them so is that is that worth going to then or is that like kind of a location that is just there to to be there um is there someone to talk to is there something interesting at all or a little bit restricted by the day night cycle and i love andrew's flying up here really high up on the hippogriff and, and we're just looking at this view of Hogwarts in the distance. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's part of what I love most about flying around in this game, whether it's on a hippogriff or, or, or on that's the That's awesome. You know, Seeing I, the school I mean, like right there. there. And things that you can see in the distance. And that's one of my, I, I still can't get over, like no matter, I play this so much, but I still, I still can't get over the fact that I can see Hogwarts out there. And there's just something beautiful about knowing that all of, all of the things inside of it, the classrooms, the students, the professors, um, all the places I can go, I can just fly my hippogriff, land in the courtyard, enter the front doors, and just walk, you know, to the library. So no students have a problem with the fact that you're just casually flying into the school on your hippogriff? <laughs> or to class, or to greenhouse, or to my common room, that it's all contiguous and just kind of like one, one space is still exciting to me after all this I time. mean, I'm just, just... <laughs> I'm speechless right now. It's just absolutely beautiful. It's just, oh my God. As much as we want to spend a lot more time out here just flying around, experiencing the world, uh, I think this is a great opportunity to switch over to combat. And last time we gave you kind of a yeah, the, intro the, to the combat, this time we're going to really go terrain uh, a lot more is deep dive really on, good. Uh, using the Dark Arts Battle Arena really good. part of our deluxe edition. And there were like right, no stutters at all. Like a lot of time, like you play like a Bethesda game and you're going through and then you get stutters as the new area loads and none of that whatsoever. And they were going across a very far distance. So it's really impressive. Dark Arts Battle Arena is, uh, which is part of the deluxe and digital deluxe edition. I, I, I love the way that the Dark Arts Battle Arena is actually uh, part of the world. It's integrated into the world. So your experience is more immersive than just choosing an option from from the main menu of the game or something like that. Reason to go to the Forbidden Forest. Exactly. <laughs> there are many reasons to go to the Forbidden Forest, but uh, he's also wearing the uh, Dark Arts cosmetic set. Mm. And uh, here he's pulling out the Thestral, which is oh my God. part of that Dark Arts <laughs> pack from the Deluxe and Digital Deluxe Edition. So we're going to buy the Deluxe Dark Edition. <laughs> uh, okay, that's where I'm going to But I like this, uh, this battle arena. It is a great place to show off um, really combat in a big way because it unlocks some interesting abilities and this for isn't you this and, isn't and you to, to... this isn't even the full like great view of it too because um one the detail in the environments is just at like the same level of detail in the school which we saw from the last gameplay showcase was done so 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 well and you look at like the forest and the way the terrain is cracked like this is what i want for starfield do, do, do people understand like why i because this is very clearly obviously there's some procedural generation but then they go in and really craft it but it, it, that's what skyrim did and it worked really well because everything felt like there was intention behind how paths and mountains and trees were laid out right um, and that's what I like. So that's where my concern for start, because I see it in a game like Hogwarts Legacy. It looks great. It gets me excited for Hogwarts Legacy. And then for Starfield, you see those barren open environments with generic hills and mountains. And you're like, ah, all right. So, you know, that's, that's, uh, really that's where the concern, but this looks incredible. Yeah. And this doesn't even look as good as it is because there, you know, this is like a 1080p with like, there's some blurriness going on. They're releasing a 4k version right way. after the showcase. And is this like the only arena like this in the game where you can like practice? And yeah. Do... So in the, in the base game, we have uh, two combat arenas normally that, and so everyone mm -hmm. has access to those. The atmosphere. And each of the combat arenas are an opportunity to kind of just go through a difficult combat challenge, fight through multiple waves in order to 
uh, earn a, uh, a different cosmetic for your character and add that to your collection. Um, in the case of the, that's no different than the Dark Arts Battle Arena, that's also true, uh, the Combat Arena. But, uh, but uh, one of the things that we're excited about in the Dark Arts Battle Arena that people can do is, is you come in preloaded with different abilities. So uh, the unforgivable curses are something that everyone's going to have access to through the base game and going to be able to earn. Mm -hmm. And they can make choices in order to mm -hmm. kind of like add that to their repertoire. And they can also commit to that down with certain talents and things like that. When you, when you play the Dark Arts Combat Arena, you actually have access to all those things as kind of like a, a way to test them all. And so it's a chance to kind of like tour and play with the dark arts and decide whether or not that is a path that you kind of want to go down. Um, but but yeah, okay. everyone has the same ability to explore explore the dark arts. This is just kind of like a way of previewing. And again, I wonder if people are going to be able to like deep blur that and find general. out what they're uh, so looking at. We're gonna jump in here. Andrew's going to start just start battling, and we can start talking <laughs> about uh, everything you're seeing on the screen. All right. <laughs> Oh my <laughs> He's just about to right away. God, God. <laughs> we're, start, we're starting off strong. Oh my god, is, strong. It, is that was that Kujio? Oh my god. That's so cool. Yeah, so that you'll you'll notice right away like when we use Avada Kedavra, that guy's health bar went from instant to zero. And we really are trying to honor the way Avada Kedavra works in the game. Uh, yeah, that was brutal. Um you'll notice that like the the meter takes up a, a lot longer to yeah, a little uh, cool kind down. of build up as a way to kind of deal with its extreme power just so that it's still fun to use and then there's some, some okay ways that we'll probably talk about to, to to so so they have um they have um this blue bar i guess is where you could use the more powerful spells like your your cruciatus and but they just use crucio just and that. avada kedavra know, at right? the same I don't know time if there are things on the screen that you just have questions about well, like, we're, like i see like little blue things pop, uh, pop up <laughs> from yeah. the enemies also we put, like that sign, well, it's like, so in the community, we call it the ancient magic sign. And I don't know if that's how it's called yeah. <laughs> in the game. So the community is astute. So uh, on the development side and in player facing in the game, we reference that as your ancient magic meter. Oh, <laughs> so it is ancient magic. <laughs> the, ancient yeah. magic so meter. As your, as your abilities in the game keep growing and you become exposed to some of the secrets about your own kind of history and your own, your own abilities, um, you start unlocking new powers. So one of those powers, you'll see the R1 button appearing uh, throughout the game. Uh, that's an ancient magic throw, we call it, that allows you to kind of like draw an object to you and fling it at an enemy. Um, okay. But whenever you see the R1 or the L1 plus R1 appear over somebody's head, mm -hmm. um, that's an ability to cast a, a very devastating and powerful uh, ancient magic spell oh, to do a ton of damage against the Okay. Character. And the way that manifests itself uh, depends on the type of enemy that you're fighting. And you'll see a, a wide variety of enemies in here that are- So that was an ancient magic spell. Ways. You'll notice there's, there's uh, abilities- So what, so what drained that, exactly- uh, Depends on the type of enemy that you're fighting. And you'll okay, so the ancient and magic the is the blue bar. Itself, when he uses uh, the ancient magic the ability, that, that, that L1, R1. You'll see a, a wide variety of enemies in here- It goes away. The, player in different ways. the curses are just on a normal cooldown. Uh, abilities that kind of bubble up under the player. A long cooldown. That force him to move. And there's different ways that we want the player to kind of move around on the battlefield. And that's actually a good link to the ancient magic meter in general. And the reason why I say that is because as you're doing different things in combat, you're protegoing and you're doing different abilities and you can kind of speculate with your talents, there are different ways to get that meter to build faster and faster. But one of the most effective base ways to build up that meter fast, that way you can launch these devastating attacks whenever you want to, is is to actually perform combos. So you see that combo uh -huh. here, and it's almost like your your emotions are combos. And then basically, Jesus that Christ. built up enough that you can attack someone. But as the combo meter builds up, at some point you strike someone, and a, a piece of their magic kind of falls out of them. You'll see these blue orbs in in the in the game world, and there's something that only you can see in in the narrative in the world. And it's another reason to move around on the battlefield if you can go up and collect those things and. But then they give big, big jumps to that ancient magic meter as we're playing. Okay, so so they have like those little blue orbs. They have like drops that come out, and you can you can use those as like pickups to to help boost some of your abilities. About, about spells uh, and magic here, but I think there's another. Huge... And this this combat, I have to say, when I did my initial uh, analysis of the game, like when the gameplay trailer first dropped, when that had happened. 
Uh, I was very critical about, uh, critical about the gameplay because it was like, why are they just attacking all at once? And you kind of see a little bit of that here, but there's a lot more dynamic things going on. So it's, I mean, we already knew this, but it is tied to the difficulty, like kind of the aggressiveness of the enemies, which is good. I think that's a great way to do difficulty versus just stuffing up your health bars or making them take less damage and deal more damage. Like that's very lazy difficulty sliders. Um, but this, this can be really good. It's a very dynamic combat system with a lot going on. It looks fun. You know, um, like I like bullet hell games like Risk of Rain 2, love that stuff. So, you know, when you get kind of that high intensity, like you need to react fast and cast your shield and do this and then attack and get that guy because he's the one that's the real threat right now because they're really, you know, aggressive. Um, you know, this enemy type can really do damage to you if you leave him unchecked. I like that kind of difficulty when you stack the different types of enemies that really complement each other. Um, it's a very D and D thing, actually. You have one enemy that can do this and one enemy that can do that, so that way you have this big combination of things versus just like a lot of enemies, or they do more damage. So this oh, looks combat. this and looks awesome. The, the tools that you can bring to combat as well, the kind of yeah, uh, blocking the spells off screen is good. Play, like just being a general be, awareness you know, of, a lot of you know, I like that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so the the tools are really interesting because they're basically like a prior investment. So you can bring the potions and the plants that you grow in the room of requirement to combat uh, to essentially kind of help you um, defeat enemies a lot quicker and, and more efficiently. So some of the tools that you'll see here are like the rock skin potion. So uh -huh. that is something that basically it covers your skin in this like rocky material that uh, reduces the incoming damage that you're receiving. So against big enemies, hard hitting enemies like trolls, um, that's super helpful. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh my god, she's just destroyed. <laughs> the, the troll just collapsed. From one of the Sorry, <laughs> troll. Uh, obviously we have the Wigan Will potion as well, uh, which increases your health. And then we have the focus potion. So when Alan talks about having to balance Avada Kedavra with a long cooldown, because obviously it's an instant kill, uh, one thing that you could do is brew a focus potion, and that will increase um, how quickly your your cooldowns. Uh, All right, wait, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. There we go. There we go. There we go. There we go. There's a lot. There's a lot. There's a lot the going on there. So when Alan talks about there's a lot going on there. We got to take a look into long cooldown because obviously it's an instant kill. Uh, one thing that you could do is brew a focus potion. All right, Chinese chomping cabbage. When released, attacks nearby enemies. Seeds can be purchased at dogweed and death cap. Must be grown in medium or large pots. So look at all. This is this is a cool way to do it. You got all the different potions. Right, and then you got your your herbology if you want to do your herbology stuff. So I like that there's probably two ways always to kind of tackle similar situations. Like I think this is great. And that will it's a increase, great way to do it. Um, how quickly your your cooldowns uh, regain. Right. You know, I don't want to do herbology. I want to do potions. Okay, you're not punished for not doing herbology. He's doing to the troll right now. Like he's just bouncing around around the arena. He's like not. And the troll makes him move around too, Luke. Like, mm -hmm. I love that they give you the power to do that. Yes. A lot so of games are like, we can't let the, them be that strong. The uh, setup of the arena. Hogwarts we Legacy is like, nah, just that kill that guy. Like, so we have things like the venomous <laughs> tentacula that you can put down and it acts like a turret and it just kind of shoots enemies around the battlefield. That is so cool. This is like a truly like Hufflepuffian way to approach <laughs> the battle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> No, that was super important to us, that there were these like multiple ways. And so you can see there's there's a ton of different things you can use. Uh, the Mandrake is one, so you can pull it out and it stuns with its like piercing cry, these enemies uh, in, in a radius. And another thing I want to call out uh, that we're seeing on the side of the screen here is these, these dueling feats, which I, I love because I love anything that prompts me to play a game in a different way, a unique way. I don't want to get stuck in my style, you know? Uh, and, and so this is a way to, if you want to get stuck in your style, go for it. If you just want to blast people with spells, go for it. But we also want to uh, have some things over here that may make you use certain plants or certain potions or block more. Yeah, or, I'm not, yeah, I'm not usually crazy about those um, challenges. Uh, I don't care the for them. Stream. And the field guide challenges, this is the way that the field guide manifests like challenges for you to do in combat. And mm -hmm. exactly to your point, um, we just wanted a way to but encourage players to, to explore. The it does. It helps players help experiment a bit. To just kind of practice with them and explore what they want to do. Because there really are so many different ways that you can push talents. Uh, when you see the, the green X's on characters. That's right. And that's kind of a, through your talents, you can unlock this kind of cursing mechanic that sort of like links the fates of these different characters on the battlefield. That way, uh, as you get the, the, as you're cursing different characters, they all begin sharing damage. And so 
we have things oh. like Avada Kedavra, which is the insta-kill, but if you curse everyone before you insta-kill this one guy, they can all drop dead for that. Ah, oh, they did like a Dishonored. I mean, I know it's not so, unique to Dishonored, but. There are, there are Dark Arts fantasies. There's fantasies about being more of a defense against the Dark Arts character, things like that, that misty step that you see. Nice, um, chicken. Occasionally being used on Polymorph. the field. And we can also spec into our potions and plants to make them more powerful and more efficacious. So it's wow. all about which type of player you feel like you are and whether or not you want to play with prep on the fly or with deliberation. And those are all different options. That is so cool because like it's like, I see so much like going on on the screen, just so much complexity. And I, I want to just it try looks fun. myself like which style works best. It looks a like, lot of fun. Ancient magic, to be honest, feels like much more powerful than just the dark arts. Yeah. And speaking of plants and potions, we are going to be putting the dark arts away, put those unforgivable oh. curses away, uh, and heading to the room of requirement, which is your home within Hogwarts, a personalizable space. I wonder if there's uh, consequences to using more, more dark spells the more you go into it. Like, things and, uh, there should absolutely uh, be. <laughs> All right, Andrew's got us in the room of requirement, uh, wearing, we, we kind of went casual Not mode punishment, here, but wearing a nice jumper. Um, and, and I think that's a, a punished good for playing a certain point, way jumping off point uh, <laughs> <laughs> for uh, the personalization of the space as well, not just your character and, and the visuals of your character, but actually this space is a, a place that you can make your own. Um, yeah, it was super important to us that this space really did feel like um, your reflection uh, as a wizard. So you can change the architecture in here. What? Uh, <laughs> different themes throughout uh starkly different themes uh to really just hammer home that this is this is yours you oh my god <laughs> what <laughs> this is beautiful that's cool we never expected that to be oh my god that's neat that's the thing is not only can that's you fun. change the architecture here but you can actually conjure little objects uh into this space as you can see so you can, there's like statues that you can do and ornaments and tables and rugs and just a bunch of little things that cool. really flesh out the space and bring it As to someone life. who oh likes the <laughs> settlement we, system we in Fallout, I like that. Like those places where you brew stuff, that's where you can change, but you can do all of this. Where do you even get this stuff? Like there's a furniture store? In there? <laughs> yeah, so we call them conjurations. Uh, and the conjuration recipes can be purchased at Tomes and Scrolls in Hogsmeade. Um, but also as you engage in different types of gameplay throughout the world, you'll be rewarded with uh, different objects. That's so cool. And you change color? Mm -hmm. You can change the color, you can change the size of it, and you can mm -hmm. place it basically anywhere. Oh, oh my god, you're so tiny. <laughs> That's like fun. That's a fun mechanic. <laughs> and I love how the, the system I'm, too is designed. I, I mean, I'm not even going to probably use it that much. Like, I'll do a so little bit, but... the effect of conjuring it in, and you're... you're you're actually doing this in the world as your character, but the, the way neat that it's an it, option, like that gameplay with yeah. the, the immersive uh, uh, design of personalizing oh the space. Oh my god! Like, and I love the animation how it like appears. You know, like it's not just like there. It's like it yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like it is really. I know some people, people are gonna be like making the coolest. Really nice because some people are just gonna be making like the coolest room of requirements. I'm gonna have the most bog basic, like the standard thing with an extra rug or a ch extra chair in it or something. <laughs> and everyone's gonna be making these complex, like monumental creations right. in it. The magic in the Wizarding World is it's neat. everywhere. It's neat. It's, it's cool. It's physical. It's kinetic, and it's whimsical. We really really wanted to nail that whimsy in this space. Uh, another thing that I wanted to discuss is that not only can you like conjure things and you can change their their look, but you can do that with the utility object. There's well. rooms so down there too. Like, pots it keeps going. Stations, and you can change the look of those uh, as well. And these are the areas where, as we had mentioned previously, you'll be growing your plants, you'll be brewing your potions. Right, 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 right. So while you're also doing these uh, like kind of nurturing based activities, this is also the space uh, where you would bring your gear, gear to be identified and gear to have um, like traits put on it, which I believe Alan can talk to. Oh, yeah. Um, I, we keep bringing up appearance and and how it looks, and and on a, like a, in the game, you can look like anything you want to whenever you want to. Um, but the player will be finding different types of gear that we call it uh, as you progress through the game. Mm -hmm. And essentially, we just know that that clothes and different items in the Wizarding World can have different magical properties. And as you, uh, as you explore and as you adventure and as you defeat enemies, you're going to be finding different pieces of gear um, that have different abilities 
and that can help you in your journey and are a major part of you kind of growing as a wizard and advancing as a wizard. Oh, and so a nice, nice, nice. Okay, so <laughs> you have like uh, time, charm uh, charm slots basically. Whenever whenever you get a new piece of gear, you don't necessarily know exactly what it does. And so there is a station inside of the room of requirement that you can conjure. It's one of the first things you conjure uh, called an identification station where you can actually bring that, that gear that you're uncertain cool. about and learn what its abilities are. Right, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> and then as the space advances even further and the space will eventually grow its own rooms and you're going to get new recipes, you know, like, like grow Mackenzie's new talking rooms. about. All these different things keep expanding. And as it expands, eventually you're going to earn what we see here, which is called a loom. And when you set up a loom, it's a, an ability to essentially customize exactly which magical properties are on your gear and take any piece of gear and adjust its properties. And so this is where, like, some of the... And, this is what I get excited that, about, is these RPG like elements that, like, customizing of, the gear, changing the traits. Uh, of um, appearances, we call it, mm -hmm. or um, cosmetics, we've been referring to it right. in this stream. Those types of things you can use and you can apply a look to any other other look. So if you get a piece of gear, you put it on, you look like that, but you can change it to look like whatever you want. That's so cool. And, and it, like you transmog. Just, so you they can got transmog. Put some ability to this sweater, but then you can just swap yeah. that ability. Yep. And the appearances you can edit whenever you want in the gear screen. The loom is specifically about applying uh, traits and and applying uh, larger upgrades that just kind of grant you greater statistical advantage or give you really specific abilities that w blend in nicely with where you're trying to go with your combat fantasy or talents and things like that. Interesting. I'm just like, I'm just seeing that, that they're just like pumpkin fur, moon cuff fur. What, where does that come from? <laughs> yeah. And so, you'll notice uh, so that I'm a bit confused with the way the menus are going. Uh, and to upgrade your gear. Uh, um, based around beast. Those menus so confuse me a little bit. I'd have to, care, I'd have to play uh, it and then I'd be like, oh, okay. Which but is just like looking at it, I could Bavario. wait, wait, what? Oh. Like, kind of bigger space on the inside. What? What's up, idea. And so you can see here we have a couple of beasts out. We have a grap horn and a moon calf <laughs> and a niffler uh, and a neasel as well. So oh, quite see, a this is this so, oh the God, attempt, the like love for the franchise in this game is <laughs> so apparent. Oh my God, then together. Oh. That's so cute. Like the amount they're of passion adorable. that these developers so have for what they're making care, is like uh, is it's it's so refreshing. Well, but feeding them too. This game so doesn't feel things, corporate, I guess, to me can, at least. Give you their, their magic like there's, ingredients. So it, it, it feels like a passion um, project. Fur, et cetera, uh, that can then be used in your in your gear. That is like so like intuitive because like you know that makes sense because when you touch the animals you get some fur <laughs> <laughs> leftovers. That's so. Oh my God. Yeah, and we really want to hammer home the fact that this is like a home that you're making for them. So in the Overland, you can find these beast dens uh, and rescue these beasts. Part of doing so is brushing them and feeding them <laughs> food as well uh, and to build that relationship with, with your beast. In addition to be able to care for beasts, you can actually... Uh, I liked how the moon camp was waddling well. over to uh, him. The house, the cottage. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> And so we have like a lot of little ornaments uh, in this area. And a lot of them are purely cosmetic, but they look really cool. Again, it's the personalization uh, of this space. Oh my goodness. No, this is like, I'm going to spend eight hours. Just the customization this in this area. game deserves like, this is, like its cool, own like, video. This little just talking there, about like all the things that you could change. Stand, and so that's say. without <laughs> the con just that's without the combat, without it. the yeah, no, totally. Going and around like the open world, aspect. like just but the customization is its own we topic inside, of discussion. Uh, there's well, so much there's here. There's a utility, uh, utility aspect to it, oh. too. So as you uh, progress in the game and you're able to purchase more conjurations, you're able to speed up your process. So one of them, for example, is the food processor, which uh, allows for the beast in the space to... And no microtransactions that we know of yet. Uh, and so you're, you're really building the progression for yourself here. Um, in addition, there's also a toy box where you, oh, <laughs> where you can a... play with your beasts. You'll see here, yeah. So you can, um, there's a bunch of toys in it, uh, and each beast has their own favorite toy. So as you can imagine, the moon calf really likes the moon ball, mm -hmm. uh, or the needle <laughs> as like a little cat really likes to chase the yarn ball as well. Right. <laughs> and they're oh, super wow. cute. Oh my god. Just watching them, it's so cute. <laughs> And the big thing we really wanted to hammer home uh, is that the world is a dangerous place. And so by going and rescuing these beasts and bringing ba them back here uh, and caring for them, you're really helping helping them out. Yeah, this is like a whole thing in and of itself. Uh, they have like a Nintendogs. <laughs> so Nintendogs magical creatures. 
My gun is just a grab cord. It's just gigantic. Huff a puff with evil wizard lair in, in the room of requirement. Listen, everyone has a dark side. Everyone has a dark side. Uh, you could actually name them as well. So, like your dog. So, getting back into that personalization. Not like your cat, you know, just yeah, we, like we, your dog. Just like throw in, oh, here's a, here's a grab horn in here. Like, this can be named whatever Andrew's about to name them. Bruce. I would name you <laughs> Big Chungus. Uh, you know, we, we've, we've created this really nice space, and, and uh, you, you can get additional. Vivaldi's Giant correct, Stumpy. Uh, to different kind of aesthetics and looks to where you're keeping yeah. your beasts and caring for them. Progression is a big part of this space as well. So as you progress through the story, uh, you will unlock more of a barium. So as you can see, this one's quite meadow themed, um, big, open, bright, uh, but there's other ones, say like a swamp that you might encounter. Um, and it's really a visual effect to, uh, and more space for, for your beat. Oh, so it's like those, so when we're inside the room requirement, there's like on the left, there's that moon glow from one this is a cool way to do the placement of objects right. too because it's very about? dynamic exactly like ah, oh you put trees in here too oh my god you know they could have very easily and and another thing with the the beast been like is, is a great, great type uh, system you know, but you literally just like the like fallout kind of thing just that you did with like the broom place here, where place the here. broom is not just a, a method of travel it's it's actually built in and integrated into the world in the same way, like beast care isn't just this this added element. You're not just throwing it on top. There's really this like narrative and, and integration to yeah everything, everything connects. So as you progress through the missions, you'll expand the space. Um, as you earn resources, you'll go into Hogsmeade and and use them to uh, unlock the gameplay here and, and unlock new conjurations and different things to play around with in the open world. Uh, it's in those different. Um, in those different environments, like the different combat and conflicts Ooh, and bandit big. camps and different things like that that exist in the Overland, those things are what hold recipes uh, that exist in the loom. So all these things okay. have a way of connecting. Um, Moonstone that you find out in the world is the resource that we use to conjure everything that's found throughout the world. Um, forgeables are used for recipes. So really everything's like a everything's like a cycle and keeps you coming back. But even with the story that's being told too, I, you know, I think people know who Poppy is and, and uh, that she has a particular affinity for beasts. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think everything we're seeing here, you know, you're gonna be venturing out into the world uh, and and this is just kind of the tip of the iceberg, even, even of kind of like your interactions with beasts in that narrative. That's so, awesome. You know, you bringing up Poppy, there are more, there are more uh, kind of mysteries to discover and things to discover out in the world that have to do with her and that have to do with caring for beasts. And so different characters have their own have their own stuff uh, uh, that that just kind of make this all just kind of like the beginning, the, be the beginning of your journey. Well, we could spend hours in here, but we're gonna have to end the stream now. What do you think <laughs> about what you've seen today? I mean, this is, I'm just so blown away by how how beautiful it looks. The open world seems so detailed and there's so many things to do. And like the combat, I, we're gonna have, we're gonna spend like two weeks or more just breaking it down by pieces. There's just so much to this world. Like, All right, I'm so cool. happy you guys did this overall gameplay. Cool. Um, yeah, so there's plenty more. Thank you guys uh, for coming, blah, blah, blah. Um, A little tease. A little tease! A little tease for us there. They're getting sucked into that book. Alright, so... Very cool. Very, very cool. Uh, I like... I like everything I've been seeing about Hogwarts Legacy. Uh, it, it, there's, cer there's certain details where... And it, there's such, like, everything that I point out when I'm critical about this game, everything that I point out is such nitpicks. Such unbelievable nitpicks. Because it just speaks to the level of quality and detail that's present here. It's just absolutely astronomical. I love the changing seasons. Uh, you know, I think that adds a really impressive element to the whole thing. Uh, you know, jumping from... That's actually a really good screenshot of, of them. I'm not her. I don't know what she's doing with her hands right there, but um, 
yeah, jumping between the winter to the spring to the fall is going to be a really cool thing. Getting to see the Forbidden Forest and all of this detail is absolutely incredible. The combat looks so visceral and dynamic. Uh, it looks like a lot of fun. The, you know, a lot of games shy away from giving you an ability that's just, hey, insta-kill this enemy. And they even went against, you know, this troll that explicitly says, like, hey, they're really tough, like, be careful. And the gameplay's just like, oh, nope, killing curse, you're dead. Like, games don't give you that power that often because they want you to feel like you're challenged. And mind you, this does have a very long cooldown, but that's super awesome that they at least allow that possibility because it doesn't really happen. The dueling feats, uh, you know, it does things for some people. That You know, Chandler would basically explain it helps him play from different styles. And I think that's good. I don't use them. I don't use these types of challenges personally. They don't, they don't do much for me. This level of customization here is absolutely insane. Uh, Moonstone, as they did say, is kind of the resource that you use for everything. Uh, to, to craft most things in the game so you're going to want to be finding as much moonstone as possible but then I really do like if we kind of go to this little moment here if I can get it I really really do like that they don't necessarily punish you if you want to play a certain style so if you want to use are they going to pull up the menu I don't know exactly there we go so if you want to use potion ingredients right if you want to go into potion stuff or you want to go into herbology stuff there's ways that give you advantages and disadvantages to both and you don't necessarily need to focus in either one but of course it's going to drastically change some of your play styles and i like that i like that it doesn't necessarily punish the player because you're not doing oh you're not doing potions well you know okay, yeah you're gonna really have a really hard time because of it like though that sucks in games games shouldn't punish you for wanting to play a certain way um, that's why I'm interested to see the, the consequence, the choice and consequence level of using some of these dark spells. I'm using Crucio, I'm using Avada Kedavra, right? Those are supposed, those are the unforgivable curses, and yet we, how many times did they use it in this gameplay? So, what are the consequences? And not in such a way where it punishes you, the player, for doing that, because that's not fair. That's not fair, that's not fun. But something that says, you know, something that reflects, the world needs to reflect that you're doing those things. Um, Mass Effect 2 and 3 tried to do it. You know, you chose Renegade options. You weren't punished for doing Renegade options. But if you picked Renegade options, you'd see your appearance physically change in the game. So, you know, it was a minor cosmetic thing that ultimately you still had the choice to remove you could get facial reconstruction in the game to remove those if you don't like them but still want to play renegade so you know it doesn't have to be cosmetic but the the, the amount of the amount of stuff going on too with with the amount of care you know the fact that you can customize that it's not just here's they could have that they could have very simply just said here's the room like that this is the room of requirement you you go you go ahead play around in it and this is what you can do in it there's crafting and there's this stuff and they said no let's let you actually move things around put rugs down put up decor change the color of everything change the size of everything you know just make the entirety of the room just kind of like smurf sized if you want like that's cool that's awesome uh conjuration budget so you do have sort of a limit here which is interesting they didn't talk about at least i, I, I was talking over a lot of stuff but i don't know if they brought this up but you can only have a certain amount of stuff. I, but mind you, there's a lot going on here. The space already looks pretty full. And if that's all they use, not sure if this is just for demo purposes or if this is actually, you know, what's going on. But the, tons of opportunity for customization. And then, of course, if we could line it up properly, there are, yeah, like there's a whole room back here. So this place is absolutely massive. And then that's not even including just being able to save and rescue and care for uh, I think we're getting kicked out of... Yeah, we're going to get kicked out of the stream in a bit. But that's not even including the the outdoor stuff that you can do with the Kara Magical Creatures. The open world... The only thing I'll say about the open world part of it is... You know, the, 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 the being able to fly around on the Hippogriff looks awesome. The broomstick looks fun. I like that there's customization and upgrades for the broomstick as well. Like, that to me is an awesome, great choice. So, you know, you can't go flying above the clouds too high. You have that yellow meter that actually requires you to come back down to the ground, which encourages you to kind of look around. So you're not just like passing everything. But if you want to, then you could go on the slower, but more, uh, I guess, more 
capable in some ways hippogriff if you get the hippogriff mount so that's a cool way to do that i do like that um the customization is great the open world yeah the open world is it just going to be like a bunch of you know they flew past during this segment they flew past several things that sounded like there was some combat going on so we have all this detail in the world itself. We have all this detail in the room of requirement, in the castle, in the environment, in the landscape of Scotland, all that stuff. But does that transpire to if I land and go take part in literally right in this shot, whatever they're passing over? Is it just going to be like kill four enemies and then someone goes, oh, thank you, wizard. Here's a, re a reward and you get a couple moonstone and then you go off on your way. You know, that'll be fun for the first couple hours of the game. And that'll be fun if you're like, ah, I need some experience. So I, I don't mind this stuff in the world is basically what I'm trying to say. I don't think this, this stuff should not be in the game at all. Um, but it needs to be the stuff on the sideline, right? It needs to be the secondary content. So how much is there going to be of like really in-depth dungeons, which we haven't seen the dungeons 100% yet. Um, we've seen it a little bit. A little bit in some of the trailers but there's obviously some big puzzles that and they talked about it here there's puzzles that unlock inventory upgrades and that kind of stuff so that's really really cool uh anyway i'm really excited for this game like this is this is one of my most anticipated games i don't know why i'm so hard on this of all titles i don't know why i'm so harsh on hogwarts legacy <laughs> but but there you go there you go. Um, I, I think it's because I'm excited. I think it cause, it's because I want it to be the best it can. Like, I don't mean this any from a malicious place of like, Hogwarts Legacy, Harry Potter sucks. Like, I like Harry Potter. I like the world. Uh, obviously, there's some there's some things going on with, with uh, other areas of Harry Potter that, that have been in the media. But it doesn't mean I can't like the world, I guess. Uh, or at least that's my hope, is that it's okay to like the world of Harry Potter. So yeah, this looks fun. This looks great. I'm looking forward to seeing some of the dungeons too and some of the puzzles in the puzzle rooms because I think that'll be fun. And I really, really love the RPG elements. The robes giving you gear, having to go back and identify it, being able to customize certain feats on it. Hey, bro, man, Legion. Dude, your video, your last video was really, really good. The editing in it was was really, really great. So nice. Um, go check out Bro Man Legion if you like comedy. He does kind of like videos that react to some of the stupid things that you can find on the internet and it's very, very funny. Um, and, and some skits in there too. Like uh, uh, if superheroes were oh, man, I can't remember the name. If superheroes were like had ridiculous names. I think it was. But yeah, go check out Bro Man Legion for some comedy. He's funnier than I am for sure. <laughs> Uh, anyway, yes, yeah, Starfield just dropped a new video. That's basically what I'm gonna do. I have to, um, I have to go stop, like hop off for a little bit, and then I want to come and I want to do live stream feedback. I don't know if I just want to do straight up video to that gameplay, straight up video, or if I want to just kind of do like a live me covering that stuff, you know? Because I can do both. I know ESO usually does like live. He he paces through it. Uh, he paces through the game and then or the video and then gives his comments, pauses it, gives his comments, goes to pauses, gives his comments. So maybe I'll do that because I don't know. I just like the, pro I like the professional video format better where you actually dive through and analyze it. Um, I don't know. Maybe it just depends on the, on the, the thumbnail and the title at that point. I don't know. Maybe I just do both. <laughs> I, I was working on a video talking about where the heck Starfield was. And then that video came out right when I started the stream, basically. So yeah, we're, I I had yeah we're getting Starfield video. I'll work on that today. I want to get that out ASAP. So anyway, this game looks great. I'm sorry that you're not convinced. Uh, Mace Meso Meso V R D S E. Um, I'm gonna go with Meso. Uh, sorry you're not convinced. I I understand. I understand some hesitations to it. I do. Like you know, is is the bloat is the open world gonna be completely bloated? I don't know. It doesn't look like it, but it very well can be. Um. But then I think what's really, for me personally, what's going to drive this experience home is the environments, the RPG aspects, the choice and consequence, and the story. And if they nail those things, I will genuinely forgive. Like, if the open world is bloated and there's actually not too much to do in it or it's just very repetitive, um, you know, that's just always a concern I have with any open world game, if I'm being brutally honest. It doesn't matter if it's Hogwarts Legacy, The Witcher 4, The Witcher Remake that's coming out, Starfield, Elder Scrolls 6, that's always going to be a concern of mine, is just open world 
bloat because I don't care for that stuff and it takes me out of the game much more. Um, so I'm always going to have that concern. But if if they do the, all those things I mentioned, story, choice of consequence, right, all the RPG elements, if those things are done... I will look over all the other aspects. Like, I will completely be like, oh, bloated open world? Yeah, but it's fine because it has a kick-ass story that's just flipping awesome. <laughs> it's, really, it's really what it comes down to, if I'm being brutally honest. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. I'm looking forward to this. Let me go work on some Starfield video. Thank you guys for tuning into this stream. Uh, I Again, I don't know if I'm going to stream the Starfield kind of like ESO style or if I'm just going to do a video. Don't know. Probably a video. Probably a video. Probably a video. I'll do a video. I'm gonna do a video. I'm gonna do a video. So there you go. Uh, just walking through. Yeah, the the last game, the last gameplay showcase that they did, where they were just walking through the sh the. That's what I'm saying. Like, the level of passion behind this game is completely out of this world, and it's so apparent, and it's so visible, and the community. It has such a passionate community behind it. There's so many good things going for this game. Uh, you know, the, the the attention to detail in the castle that they showed off in the last video, in the last gameplay showcase, was just mind-boggling. Like, it's absolutely ridiculous. And then on top of that, they showed it here. Like, you just quite literally walk out from the castle, and then you're just here, if I can load it. Like, you're, you're literally just here. You walk out of the grounds. No loading screens, no transitions. There were no, no stuttering. Do both... I, I can, I can, uh, I just want to dedicate my time to the right thing because obviously this is a very timely thing I want to be on top of is honestly what it comes down to. So yeah, yeah, I, I, I can do both. I can do both. Ah, choices, choices. Like I said, I was literally in the process of, this was a video I was working on talking about, Hey, where's Starfield? Like Xbox wasn't at the Bethesda at the at the game awards this whole video all I needed to do was put in like some last couple clips and some final editing touches on this and the video two minutes left of editing this video and it would have been done and Bethesda was like oh hey Starfield constellation video <laughs> so anyway um thank you guys for watching love this game really excited got to go off and work on Starfield stuff now so oh thank you so much <laughs> thank you uh I, I know that you said in the last stream that you can't really showcase how to pronounce the name. I'm going to just go with Marie, if that's okay. Um, but I know that uh, from Montreal, some French Canada. So I understand. But thank you so much for that. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the support. And I'm definitely going to be doing some more Hogwarts Legacy stuff. But again, I'm sorry. I got to run to do Starfield. So thank you guys. And I hope to see you uh, in the next Maybe live stream in five minutes. Maybe not. We'll see. <laughs> I know. I know, bro, man. I could do both. I know. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. I really need an ending screen. I don't have one. I need to get that. I need to get that done.